Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So welcome to Face to Face. We are uh, here in Cambridge and our guest today is Shane Claiborne. Thanks for joining me, Shane. Yeah, and we are face to face. We are indeed (laughs) face to face. This is uh, often my interviews are done either over Skype or uh, on the phone and it is actually nice to be face to face and not just digitally present. Yeah, it's it's wonderful, except for the snow. When I left Philly, like we were planting our gardens, it's spring, it's April and now. We, freezing rain. We've so. seen enough robins to know that spring is around the corner, but I went walked out of the building today and it was snowing, so I don't I don't know what to tell you. Brutal. Somebody's uh, somebody's working against us, I think. So Shay, Shane But Canada, and, such warm hearts, such, <laughs> such cold weather, but it's okay. Right. Yeah. That's right. So Shane is a, a really interesting guy. I've had the pleasure of interviewing him in the past. He's got a circus past. He's uh, he's done magic. He's uh, he's a bit a bit of a uh, a juggler from what I've heard, and he's a guy who started a an organization uh, planted a community. Um, I'm not sure how he would describe it, so I'm going to let him do that in a second, called The Simple Way. He wrote a book called The Irresistible Revolution, which I read a couple of years ago, which I would highly recommend to anybody who's uh, listening today. But what I wanted to uh, chat with him about was was tell us, uh, see if he could tell us a little bit more about this community, The Simple Way, and how they as a group are actually addressing this issue of poverty. So can you tell us a little bit of the history, like in a nutshell, what, what you guys are doing? Well, sure. It's just been 20 years. We can do it. Years. Yeah. But we, you know, wow. we, we started, I was a student outside this, you know, Philadelphia in the suburbs and, uh, Really what sparked everything for us was when a group of homeless families were living in an abandoned uh, church building and they were being evicted. And we, you know, something about that just didn't feel right. So we we got a, involved and it sparked a student movement uh, where a whole bunch of us uh, moved into that neighborhood with the families. And um, yeah, we I think really we were inspired by the early church in the book of Acts in the Bible. It says that all the early Christians were together and they shared everything they had and no one claimed any of their possessions were their own. And uh, and then it also says, and there were no needy persons among them. So one of the bir- signs of the birthday of the church was that they ended poverty. We thought that was pretty great. And um, uh, so we pulled our money together, bought a house. And uh, now after 20 years, we've got, you know, about a dozen houses in, in the same neighborhood that we restored. It feels a little bit more like we've been building a village, you know, and we've got community gardens and um, parks and little things that we've created. Uh and, and, and we're very into like dealing with poverty as a, as a very holistic thing. So, uh, you know. So you're not, it's not just about handouts. It's about, you're trying to actually get to the systemic nature of what poverty is all about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of my mentors said, we, we've always heard the saying, you know, you give someone a fish to eat for a day, you teach someone to fish, they'll eat for the rest of their life. But we've also got to ask who owns the pond, you know, and yeah, who built sure. the, who built the gates around the pond? Why does a fishing license cost so much? You know? And so like, cause we, we saw that like th- there's, there's a lot of problems with uh, that, that are obviously not just personal choices, but there, I mean, our neighborhood's built around factories that moved out and we lost 150,000 jobs. Wow. Yeah, so, so now the, the question is how do we live together as a very dense population in an urban neighborhood? Um, and how do you that, not, Im- and how do you not empower those uh, sort of those, those troubling aspects of humanity, right? Right. Those troubling aspects of poverty. I mean, that's, I am being in international development. I, I think about it often, but I hear about it all the time. Mm-hmm. All those handouts, you're just, you're just propping folks up. You're just, you're not really getting to the, 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 the nature of the problem. Yeah. So that, that's what we're up to. I mean, so th- th- that's where we still do stuff like uh, help kids with homework and, you mm-hmm. know, and, mm-hmm. and, give out food bags every week. Um, and, and, and we've done that for 20 years, but we're, we're also, um, 
uh, asking questions about affordable housing and about gun laws that, you know, uh, in in the drug trafficking, which is one of the biggest industries in our neighborhood that came in since the factories left, you know, and and, and also nationally, like when our government um, is spending massive amounts of resources on militarism and war. And, um, you know, Dr. King said a country that spends more money on military defense and on programs of social uplift is approaching a spiritual death. So we we believe all of that uh, is is kind of within our mission and our scope and uh, yeah, it's, you, you know. got you got big plans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in poverty and war, <laughs> that's and then we'll right. Move to the islands. And that's have a good time. that's yeah. right. Yes, or maybe buy your own island. Maybe by then. Yeah. Um. So so how um is 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 anybody else doing this that you know of in this way? I mean, Absolutely, you've you've, you've yeah. been featured in some pretty high level publications, New York Times, and uh, different things that have talked about what you guys are up to. I mean, was it just from a reporting perspective they were doing that, or were they? Do you think actually helping you plant seeds elsewhere as well? Well, I, I think that we we've known from the beginning that we have. Uh, so a pretty amazing cloud of witnesses that have kind of paved this trail bef- before us, you know, and, 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 um, uh, Dorothy Day is a great hero of ours. And, and one of the things that she said is, is poverty is our personal responsibility. Uh, so if every person would just take in a homeless person, we would end poverty. If every family would take in a foster kid, you know, and, but she was also very critical of the systems as well. Um, so there's, there's like Dorothy Day is a, is a great hero. Mother Teresa, you know, we, we, a lot of us worked with Mother Teresa, uh, before we started the community. Um, so those are all like, people that have have been uh, singing this song, you know, before we were. Um, And now there's communities all over the place. I mean, there's communities uh, similar to ours that are um, both faith-based and communities that are not necessarily faith-based, you know, eco-villages. There's um, groups that are just trying to reimagine the way that we live, the way that we consume, uh, and, and, and that we... Uh, critique some of the the patterns of our culture, but we do that by trying to model something that's more beautiful than what we already have. So you guys really are practically living this out. This is, you don't just sit around and read ad busters and drink fair trade coffee and smoke smoke French cigarettes, do you? I mean, you well, guys well, are... we, we do read ad busters, but we don't <laughs> just read ad busters. Okay, I guess, you cool. Know, so yeah. We, yeah, but we 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 are. Um, um, well, you know, as Gandhi said, we're trying to be the change we want to see in the world. Yep. And, 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 uh, so what that looks like for, for us, I think is, is everybody trying to use their gifts and their skills to interrupt the patterns of, you know, inequity and injustice. And so we've got friends that are lawyers, friends that are plumbers, you know, we had a plumber that just moved out for a while to say, Hey, does anybody need plumbing? I'll do it for free. He's incredible. You know, he's been doing it for decades. And so I think everybody's trying to pitch in, Mm -hmm. uh, including folks, you know, that live on the block and in the neighborhood. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting thing to, one of our, our mantras is that, um, uh, it, we can do more together than we can on our own. Right, so we, we right. really, we see that every day. Do you have people that ever come in and just say, you know what? Oh, wow, this is awesome, but I just can't take it. And, uh, I got to move. I can't, I got to go back to the suburbs. I got to move back in with my parents or whatever the case might be. Or, yeah. Uh, we're not telling everybody they need to live like us or yeah. they need to move into the city. We've got nurses that run a free medical clinic that don't all live in the neighborhood, mm. but they're, so, so I they think come, that, they come yeah. in and we've got high end, like, Carpenters and co- contractors that you know pay like uh, I think it paid probably three hundred dollars a day in in jobs you know but then they come and volunteer in the neighborhood so there's I, I think that what what we all really feel is that um, the reason that we're here is is to try to live for something bigger than ourselves and and so there's a lot of ways that people can do that so it's interesting to me that you talked about faith uh, faith based communities and non faith based communities you opened up chatting about you know acts and the Bible being sort of a uh, uh, the genesis, sorry about that, but the catalyst for for you for doing what you do. Does does it follow that if you are a Bible believer, that if you are a Christian, that you're going to do this kind of work? Why is it that you chose to do it and somebody else doesn't? Why is it that these other, as you call them, non faith based communities are doing what they're doing? Is there just, you know, there's a lot of questions here, Shane, but is is it a shift that's actually occurring in the culture, um, or 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 is it something else? Do you think? I'd like to think it's more than one thing, uh, but just wondering what your thoughts wow. are. Wow. Well, I, I I think there's things that are that are shifting in the the 
kind of larger culture in, in general when people grow up um, in, with the internet and the world shrinks a little bit. And so you're this idea of like, who is my neighbor? I mean, there's a real sense that like kids that are dying on the other side of the world because they don't have a mosquito net that costs three dollars um, is a big deal. You know, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. matters to us. That matters to God. And, and so um, I think there's a lot of people that that really begin to connect the fact that the average person in North America is consuming the same amount as 500 people in Africa. And, and, you know, those kind of things like, so you hear those things, you're like, my gosh, but then I think there's a, a younger generation that's grown up like, in, in Occupy and some of these other mm-hmm, things are mm-hmm. expressions of that mm-hmm. sense of like, there's a deep inequity in the world and the world's ne- always going to be fragile as long as masses of people are living in poverty so that a handful of people can live however they want. Um, but also in the church, I, I would say that there's there's a, a, a really growing movement of, of of Christians that are convinced that um, th- that that our faith is not just a ticket into heaven, but our faith should fuel us to engage the world that we live in. And uh, so, you know, we we're not so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, you know. But and, and that's what a lot of Christians have been for us growing up, you know, just just promising people life after death when they're really asking, is there life before death? You know, like that mm-hmm, doesn't mm-hmm. your religion have anything to say to the, you know, a seven-year-old that gets right, raped or, right. you know, like the situation in Syria or whatever. So I think um, uh, part of the problem, um, one of my friends uh, used to say, is that we've only highlighted certain parts of the Bible. You know? Right, and, right. Uh, yeah, he uh, is a great singer and songwriter named Rich Mullins, and he uh, he used to say, uh, some Christians say you need to be born again. And he says, Jesus did say that to a guy named Nicodemus. You know, you need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. But but then uh, Rich said, but God, Jesus also said to a guy, if you want to be enter the kingdom of God, you got to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And uh, he said, but uh, I guess that's why God invented highlighters, so we can highlight the verses we like. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. So I think more and more of us are going, yeah, like uh, to, to be Christian and to love our neighbor um, – uh, means means a radical change of, of uh, in our life and the way that we think about our possessions and the way that we um, think about violence in the world. I mean, too so, too yeah. too often it seems to me religious movements, Christians in particular, I think, are often defined by what they uh, don't do. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and I think that's really troubling in, in a way for movements that. Uh, you know, that are supposed to be about changing the world, that are supposed to be about loving others. Uh, we we seem to have gotten, I think, as a culture, never mind any kind of faith-based aspect, but become very insular. I mean, mm-hmm. I think you can be, you know, sometimes I think we romanticize the inner city, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, it's where a community really exists, and, you know, I can walk to my bakery and you can't because you live in the suburbs. But, you know, the reality is you can lock yourself behind closed doors in the city or overseas or in the suburbs as well. Mm-hmm. So, so, um, so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how your faith has motivated you to do this. What motivates people who don't have a faith, who aren't Christians, who aren't Muslims, who, who aren't, uh, Jews, who, who don't have some sort of broader understanding, sort of some metaphysical uh, worldview that says there is something else, there is something other, or I should love my neighbor. Because really, I mean, I worked in the corporate world long enough to know that I don't think it's driven by the love of one's neighbor. Mm. Well, you might be asking the wrong person on that one, uh, you know, because I, 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 um, I, I am deeply driven by a love for God and, and, a, and a love for my neighbor. Um, but I also know a lot of a lot of folks that uh, would not profess Christianity or any faith in particular that that um, is, and some of them live much more beautiful lives than, than a lot of the Christians I know. Um, uh, and and uh, I, I remember when I was in India, I had this woman um, uh, who who said to me, "I I gotta confess, I'm I'm a little suspicious um, sometimes of of Christians who come." to Calcutta to work with the poor. Um, I said, why? She said, because sometimes it seems like they got mixed motives, that they're doing it because 
they have to or because God's commanded them to or because they want to save the poor and from hell or something. And, and she said, when you, ca- when you care for the, 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 you know, folks on the street and the kids in the orphanage, like, is it because you love God or is it because you love them? It's good. It's a great question. So it's I said, a great question. let me think about that. And I said, give me a day. You know, I came back the next day and I said, I thought about what you said. It's an incredible question. And the answer is, Yes, it's absolutely both, and I can't separate them. And I think part of the problem is too often we have we've we've you know thought that this this is and Jesus says actually these are one command to love God yeah. and love our neighbor. Yeah. And in fact, the scriptures over and over say, you know, if we pass by someone who's in need and don't have compassion on them, then how can we even say that the love of God is in us? Right, you know, that, right. that that to love God is to love those who are victims of injustice, and and so um, it, I, yeah, it it fascinates me people's motivations for doing things. And as a philosopher, having looked at morality and the obligations of you know the categorical imperative and you know Aristotle's ethics and why we do things, right? Or we 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 base our decisions on a on a sacred text. Or the existentialist says it's freedom, it's choice, it's responsibility. Um, recently, I was uh, I, I, I gave my students at Humber College here in Toronto uh, the essay "Famine, Affluence, and Morality" by Peter Singer. I don't know if you've read it, mm-hmm. but it was written in the '70s, or right around the Bang, um, Bangladeshi uh, food crisis. So this is pre-Ethiopia. This is pre-Horn of Africa, and in it, essentially, the, the argument it's a major reduction here, but to say, but Peter Singer essentially says that if you're walking by a pond and a young girl's drowning. And you have on fancy shoes and a fancy, you know, Calvin Klein suit. You're probably going to run in and save that young girl. Well, if that's true, let me tell you, on the other side of the earth right now, there's all kinds of young girls and young boys drowning. And for $22 a month, whatever it was in the 70s, you can save a young girl. Now, if we put aside the arguments about the efficacy of aid and if we put aside the arguments about child sponsorship, about whether or not you agree with it or not, it's a, I think it's a fairly compelling argument, mm-hmm. I think, and yet most of us ignore it. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'm fascinated by that, and I don't mean fascinated in a sense, oh, isn't that wonderful? I'm fascinated by it in the sense of how do I help to change that? Mm-hmm. If people aren't basing their understanding, you know, Brian McLaren says, you know, we got 4 billion people in this world that share some kind of religious faith and we can't all get on the same page. Imagine the change we could affect. Mm-hmm. So I don't even know what I'm asking you, Shane, but I guess I'm looking for some thoughts, some advice. I mean, you've traveled the world, you've seen poverty in various forms. How do we motivate others to, 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 to stir it up? To turn the world upside, you know, be well, the change you not, want to see. There's, you know? there's nothing that, that motivates us uh, like being in relationship with people who are directly affected by these injustices. You know, I, I heard um, growing up that our, our politics are shaped by what we see out the window. Mm. And so when our window changes, you know, I mean, that, and that's what fueled it for me is, I, I mean, I don't know that I would have um, become passionate about stuff that I'm passionate about had I like I they all have names and faces. So to me, you know, it's not just about a campaign of making poverty history as much as it's making poverty personal. And and I really think that one of the great tragedies is that we don't know those faces. You know, you, you see a house burned down on the news and it's sad. Like if you knew someone in that house that lost their life, it's it's catastrophic, you know? Um so the, the, and, and to me, as a person of faith, that's one of the most radical things that Jesus does is he's, he redefines family. And he said, you know, who are my brother and my sisters? Like, and, he, and he's challenging that, uh, you know, what's born of the flesh is flesh, but what's born of the spirit is spirit. And by that, the, even the, you know, the cliche of being born again was about we've got a definition of love that is not not defined by biology or geography. Like our love Mm. doesn't stop at borders. If a kid is dying on the other side of the world, it's as tragic as if it were our own child. Uh, And and Jesus consistently does that, you know? And, And so as I, as I think of that, I think that's where, that's where it has to become personal. And that's what movements have done. You know, like the civil rights movement is they brought it in your face. You, you watch these pictures and images of people being, you know, 
hosed down by water hoses with dogs sicked on them and it's, and, it's and insane it's because of the color the of their skin yeah. and, uh, their skin and and it, and it provokes in you this like you know holy indignation that you've got to do we've got to do something about that so i think that's that's what movements do is is they they humanize the injustices and and so um even with something as simple as child sponsorship with World Vision or something, I think what it does is it puts a name and a face on poverty, you know. Um, and it, 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 it and when uh, I think love comes with personal responsibility, you know. If we if we love someone, then then love requires action from us, you know. And and, and the early Christian ethic on this was was so unbelievably radical that they said. Uh, if one person, if if we have more than we need while someone else has less, then we are just like thieves. Right. If we've got two coats while someone's freezing, we, we've stolen that jacket. Um, and and that that was literally the ethic of the early church. Well, that's um, was, and that's and that's Singer's position really mm-hmm. in in his paper. And yet he's an atheist, mm-hmm. which I find really kind of interesting that he would kind of come to that same conclusion for really no apparent reason. Other than he feels under some sort of moral obligation, not guilt, but some sort of conviction. Yeah, I guess well, you and, could say. and the Apostle Paul in, in the Scriptures talks about people who who do right out of their own conscience or conviction, and 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 says like, should we not celebrate that? You know, and I would say absolutely. And C.S. Lewis uh, has a great way of saying like, the world doesn't exist in these polarities of a hundred percent Christian and a hundred percent non-Christian or something, you know, like, like there are plenty of people who would profess the name of Christ that's, that seem to be looking less and less Mm -hmm. like Christ. And Mm -hmm. there's other people Mm -hmm. that would never proclaim Christ or any religion at all, but they seem to be, uh, embodying the values that I would say are at the heart of God really beautifully. And, and so I think our job is to celebrate anywhere we see goodness at work and anywhere we see someone interrupting injustice. Um, uh, in, in, in fact, the, the God, uh, seems to do that over and over through the scriptures is use pagan kings and brothel owners and, um, terrible, you know, sinners like David. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, t- like God, God can use anybody, and and so, um, uh, the, you know, I would I would attribute that all to the movement and work of God. And if someone else says I don't believe in God, then I say call it what you want, but I want to work together with you because I love what you're doing. Yeah. Do you um do you ever find yourself uh, uh <laughs> because you're American, uh, because you're a, I wouldn't call you an evangelical, but because you're you're you know you're a Christian. Uh, because you're a follower of Jesus, do you ever find yourself embarrassed by that? You know, kind of, well, do you look at, you know, you, your country has, what is it, 5% of the world's population, but uses 50% of the world's cocaine. You know, you spend a trillion dollars in, in Iraq, you know, you're, you're, you're warmongers on some level. Um, you know, are you embarrassed by that? Uh, maybe not embarrassed is the wrong word, or, or by your Christianity because of, you know, that guilt by association. Does that make sense? Well, I don't pretend to take on all the sins of America, yeah. but I, you know, I or I, or, I, or of the church, yeah. right? Because right. you yeah. know, here you are doing what you believe is to be uh, the the right thing, following New Testament Christianity in a very specific way, and yet you've got this whole other. I mean, I can think of people that would would tune you out that are going to tune this podcast out because you talked about the Bible right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Oh, great! One of those crazy conservative Christians, right? Yeah. Click. Well, and, and, that, and that's a tragedy yeah. to me. Sure, and but I, I, I don't think that's unique to Christianity. I mean, they're they're, uh, but but some would say like no one kills like they do in the name of God, and and we've got extremists that are uh, Jewish, that are um, Muslim, that are Christian, that have perverted. I think the best of their face uh, of our face, and and and. Um, um, hijack the headlines with hatred but but to me the answer to bad religion um is to sing a better song you Mm -hmm. know to live out like like i'm i'm not willing to let the the haters uh um, hijack my faith you know people that burn the quran and hold signs that say god hates fags i mean i'll be the quickest person to stand up and say that's not a christianity that looks like christ um and, and and jesus was most critical of the religious elite of his time you know that i mean that's who he calls a brood of vipers <laughs> mm-hmm. which is, <laughs> so that so sounds I, like a punk rock band yeah actually. that's yeah. right so so um but but in the same line i'm not called 
um, I, 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 you know, changing America is a daunting task. And so, <laughs> right. like, like what, 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 what Jesus says is get the log out of your own eye. So, so the model of Gandhi to me is really beautiful, which is like, let's build a new society in the shell of the old one. You know, we'll march to the sea and get our own salt. We'll make our own clothes. The spinning wheel was one of Gandhi's symbols, you know? And so it's that which says like, we're going to reimagine the way that we live. And, and, and I think that really resonates with the way that the early Christians were because they were seen as absolute, like, outcasts and, and peculiar people that were living outside the norms. I mean, they were accused of being enemies of the state. Mm-hmm. They were accused of being traitors. Some of them were killed um, for insurrection. Jesus was accused of insurrection um, for encouraging people not to pay their taxes and not to pledge allegiance uh, to, fabulous, to, eh? to the Caesar. The, irony, you know? the irony of it. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the half the language in the Gospels, even though we've, we've kind of— um, um, domesticated domesticated it like like it was politically charged language like savior lord um all these things like every time the early christians said like jesus is lord they were saying caesar is not right and it was a renunciation of power of violence when when i mean even the fact that jesus died on a cross (laughs) i mean he was a victim of the death penalty like uh, uh, from the roman state so like yeah so i I think there's really good communities that uh, in books and thinking that is provoking that um that radical message today um and, and uh um, so, you know, we're, we're together here with Tony Campolo and one of the, one of the lines I love from Tony is he says, America, he says, it may be the best Babylon in the world, but it's still Babylon, you know, and we're called to come out of her. And that's exactly what the early Christians saw is that like, we are not, we are to be aliens in this world. We're, we're to live in ways that, that, um, that, that's what the word holy means is set apart. We're not to be like the nations. You know? Have you, have you guys ever, uh, behaved badly, uh, in your community in the sense of civil di- disobedience? I think you're the one who uses, or I think I've heard you use the phrase holy mischief. I'm not sure who. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we probably snagged that from, yeah. you know, G's magazine and, <laughs> right. and all those yeah. folks, but, but, um, well, you guys block traffic at all? Do you, oh, you know? it's, it's attributed to, to Jacques Ellul when he said that, I don't know where we got the idea Christians are meant to be normal. Christians at their best have been holy troublemakers, you know, and creators of divine mischief and folks who refuse to conform to the status quo. Um, and, 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 and that, um, um, you know, Dr. King knew that. I mean, he was a person of deep faith. And when he went to jail, he said, the first time I went to jail, it disturbed me. But then I looked at history and found that I'm in pretty good com- uh, company. <laughs> You know, so uh, yeah, I mean, we to have the self awareness and the humility and almost the arrogance as well to be able to say something like that. And there's there's a touch of that there too. It's just it's it's truly. But I I look at at the the entire story for me of 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 history, but also like that that's even embedded in the scripture is a story of uh, I I usually say divine obedience rather than civil disobedience. But it was people that were. refusing to uh, obey any unhuman orders, you know, and it was a story of fugitive slaves in Exodus. It was Moses' entire birth was an act of civil disobedience. He's floated down a river in a basket. He's taken in by Hebrew midwives that raise him illegally, you know. I mean, the the magi that came to visit Jesus when he was born disobeyed Herod's edict to come back and tell them where he is, tell him where, where Jesus is. Like the early Christians, you know, um, where, where they said, when the laws of man get in the way of the laws of God, we obey God. And uh, St. Augustine said, an unjust law is no law at all. So, like, it, it's our our uh, duty to obey the good laws and disobey the bad ones. And, and yeah, in our community, we've been... We've been arrested dozens of times, and I, I always tell the kids, like, when if you see us on the news getting arrested, it's because you can get arrested sometimes for bad things, but you can also get arrested for good things. How, um, uh, so is it a city of brotherly love? <laughs> on good days. <laughs> on good yeah, days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not just our city. I mean, our city, you know, has passed anti-homeless ordinances that we've gone to jail for, but also, um, you know, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, when when the bombing started, I, I was in Iraq when the, the Iraq, you know, shock and awe campaign started. The second second one. The the father or son. What's that? Father or son? Which which war? The se- the shock and awe yeah, was yeah, the, the second shock and one. Was it? Yeah, ten yeah. years ago. Yeah, I that's was right. In Iraq. Yeah, okay. and um. 
because it was that important to me that that um, to to try to be to get in the way of of the violence in the war and and, and everybody in my community went to jail on the first day of the bombing um, for nonviolently blocking this the federal buildings where that law would be signed into action you know um, where that war would be signed into action and and so. Um, uh, but all, almost, I mean, over and over, I think that's a part of how we raise into question, uh, uh, raise the questions around injustice. And, and what I love about what you're doing is, it sounds like you're so pra- you're in the middle of it. You're practically engaged. You're you're trying to make a difference. You told a story uh, in one of the sessions. Uh, uh, we're at a social justice conference uh, currently, by the way, but, and you talked about uh, some of the the children in your community that are learning how to grow um, vegetables. And you talked about the wonder of these kids, and I mean, I don't. I, I, I've, I've met you a couple times. I don't get any sense of cynicism from you at all. I would consider myself a hopeful cynic. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm idealistic. I've studied philosophy. I, of course, I imagine a better world, but I'm also deeply cynical when I, not need to be, but when when I choose to be. Yeah, I, I don't get that sense from you. There's this hope. There's this wonder. There's this sense of discovery that. Damn it! Things are going to change. Mm-hmm. They are going to get better, and yeah. and because I, you know, as you were telling the story about getting arrested at the wherever those laws were signed, how, how do you do that and and think, wow, this really is making a difference? You know, geez, well, I'm just another guy in the news tonight, and and you're 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 fodder in between friends and two broke girls or whatever the shows are that people are watching. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I I would say that the the my hope comes. Um, N- not necessarily because I've done empirical evidence that like every for for the you know for every act of goodness there's an equal result for that you know I mean that was what Gandhi said it's of utmost importance that we do what's right you know no matter what the results and so um, so like when when Dr. Martin Luther King said that the, the the arc of the universe bends, bends towards, towards ju- justice. justice. So, so it, it's the, yeah. this, that image, and it is wondrous that like grass can pierce concrete. You know that like um, that that there are uh, e- even if we you know if we, if we're, if we're building friendships with like ten people that are on the street and only one of them makes it out, like that 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 doesn't mean that it was worthless. In fact, right. it means all that anything is possible. And so I I have a friend that always says, like, faith is about believing despite the evidence Mm -hmm. and watching the evidence change. Mm -hmm. Um, And and, and I really believe, like, when the scriptures say, who hopes for what they see? Like, our our hope is not built on on, um, uh, – everything looks impossible when you start. Every great social movement before it happened looked impossible. And then after, as as people look back, it looked inevitable. You know, and everybody would say, of course we ended slavery. Right, well, that's not right. what people were saying during it. Well, that's know? not, and I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't think Rosa Parks, I don't think that was going through her mind when she sat down yeah. on the bus, right? right. And that, that I, I've come back to that many times in interviews and just my own thinking. What was it that went through her mind? How did she finally say, you know, because you often hear people of my parents' generation say, well, you know, they might have been racist, but, you know, that was the thinking of the day. As if to say, we're going to justify the, the fact that they didn't stand up, that they didn't stand out and, and, and be outraged by this. Well, hang on, maybe so, but there were lots of people that did, like Rosa, you know. Mm-hmm. How did she come to that conclusion to say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to stand for this anymore, you know. So it's, uh, I, I, I'm with you. I'm hopeful too. I believe in incremental change. I, I uh, Two kids, five and seven, and, and, and the fact that they're uh, asking good questions about injustices in the world that, that, that are, it makes me smile on so many levels and, 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 uh, so, sounds like you guys are in the middle of that as well. And hope changes the person who hopes, uh, as right. well in, in the sense that like, as the prophets say, uh, Isaiah and Micah, they say, God looks down and says, my people will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks and study war no more. If we know that's what's happening, then it makes less and less sense to keep like making swords, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, if we know that in the end, like, like peacemakers are the children of God, you know, that that people are going to beat the tools of death into things of life, then like, it, it doesn't make sense to continue to deal in the business of death, you know. And 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 so I think as we think of um, poverty. Um, 
it, I'm, I'm so hopeful because I, I believe with all of my heart that there's the problem is not insurmountable, like that God didn't make too many people or not enough stuff. But as Gandhi said, there is enough for everyone's need, but there's not enough for everyone's greed. And, and so we do have to make some significant changes, but like, you know, this day our daily bread is a possibility uh, or Jesus wouldn't have taught us to pray it. Thanks, Shane. I uh, hope we can do this again uh, another yeah. time. I just, I feel like, uh, every, I think I end every, pretty much every interview this way. I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface. Yeah. And appreciate, get, yeah, appreciate getting to know you more and, and thanks for your thoughts. Thank you.